morning, church. It's good to be together this morning. Uh, we started a new tradition a couple of years ago. Anytime somebody's baptized in our service, uh, we give them a standing ovation. So let's go ahead and stand and let's clap, clap this girl in. So awesome to, to have her. <laughs> That's uh, uh, real quick, that girl is uh, very special to my family. Uh, that big fella in the baptistry there is my best friend, my very best friend. So he is my closest friend and that's uh, his little daughter. She's kind of like a niece to ours. So a uh, very, very special day to see that. Today, church is a day that we have been praying about for months, for months. It's a big Sunday. It's a big Sunday because today we are gonna share some details about our REACH initiative. Now, if this is your first Sunday with us or you've only been with us a couple Sundays and the word reach isn't really all that familiar to you, this is a different Sunday. It's a special Sunday where we're gonna share some details about what the future of our church is gonna look like as it pertains to this reach initiative. So it is a little bit different, but we get to do this together. We get to do this together. Many of you received in the mail this past week a REACH packet detailing what our initiative is all about. For the last several weeks, we've talked about the why. Why? Why will we continue to REACH our community? As we jump into some of the why, but more of the what, the details, let, let's go to our core verse for our initiative. It comes to us out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And this is, eternal, this is an eternal promise in the eternal word of God. The apostle Paul writes to the church that is meeting in Ephesus in Ephesians 3, 20. He says this, now, now to him who is able. Now, there, there's a lot of things that were taking place within the church of Ephesus. Just like there was a lot of things that were taking place within the church here in America today. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, the power of God in the people of God. He says to him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout what? All generations, all generations, young, middle, old, forever and ever, amen. And over the last four weeks, we've been talking about why. Why is the REACH initiative so important to the future of our church? Today, we're gonna to talk about the what. For the last about 18 months, almost two years, we've been asking one very, very important question. How can we become even more intentional to reach our community with the grace and truth of Jesus? See, John chapter one tells us that Jesus was filled with both grace and truth. Not one or the other, but both grace and truth. So what does it look like for us as followers of Jesus to share the grace and the truth of Jesus in our community? We've been asking that question. We believe the large part of the answer to that question comes to us in the form of three words. These words are reach here, reach there, and reach everywhere. In order to become more intentional to reach right here, our surrounding community around 8145 North High Street, our current campus, we need to maximize our current facility. That is a very important thing that we need to do, maximize our current facility. And today we're gonna to talk about some of those details. It's gonna be a risk, but it's a God orchestrated risk. Reach here. Well, in order to become more intentional to reach the communities that continue to grow north of us, we need to set aside resource money to be able to dream about how we can more effectively reach there, reach there. And then we need to become even more intentional with how we embrace the new front door of the church, which is online, reach everywhere. Now we received this packet in the mail, and it detailed quite a bit of what the REACH initiative is about. 
Most of you received this. Some of you did not. If you did not receive it, we have them located in the atrium around our reach station. There's a timeline out there. We have them located at all our giving bins and throughout the church. But today we're going to share some of those details. Many of you know this fine fella next to me. This is a good friend of mine that I've known for a number of years. This is Lee Cox. He serves as our executive minister. Lee and his wife, Sarah, have been a part of our team for 22 years now. And so Lee's going to share a little bit about how we came to the REACH initiative and then share some of the what details. Lee? I'm just, I'm really disappointed. I just found out I'm not your best friend. True, <laughs> true. So I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I want to take us back to 2020. Nobody wants to go back to 2020, but let's go back there for a minute. It was a bad year for everybody. But for some of us, it was an absolutely horrible year. There were were some really difficult things that may have happened in your family in 2020. But I I think 2020 helped us in that we spent a lot of time in prayer. There were things outside of our control on many different levels, and and, and we thought, we we need to pray. We need to pray through this. And out of that prayer, there were some things that we're talking about today that that really came out of that time of prayer uh, with, with our Father in heaven. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we were planning on doing in 2020, but we kind of rushed it a little bit because we had to, because we had to not meet in person for just a few weeks, was our, our online services. And, and you just said that that's become our, our front door. It's our front porch of our house that most people, if they're new to this church, they're actually going to watch online for a few weeks. And we've even had folks that have watched for six months and a year before they actually come here. But then they come here and they say, I want to be baptized. I've been watching, I've been listening, and I want to be a part of this fellowship. That's something good that came out of 2020. Mm -hmm. Something else that was really good that came out of 2020 is a conversation, a meeting that we had with the organization, Intentional Churches. What Intentional Churches does is they partner with churches all over the country to help them identify uh, one or two, maybe even three things that, that, that they need to do to become more intentional, to, to reach people in a more effective way, and to nurture those within, within their church. And so we looked at a couple of things, two specific things, to help move us forward, uh, and they're called Vision Initiative Projects, VIPs. Visionary Initiative Projects that we chose had to do with engagement. Engagement, how do we get people engaged from the front porch into a fully functioning follower of Jesus? What does that look like? And the other project we looked at was the facility. And really, how can we use the facility to engage and how can we be more on purpose with God on on a weekly basis? What does that look like? So we developed a couple of teams. Uh, The facilities team got to work really quick and got a hold of an organization, BGW. It's a design Uh, build company out of Salt Lake City, Utah. That's a long way off, but they partner with local contractors. So they partner with Weaver Construction up in Worcester for Ohio projects. Both of these organizations are Christian organizations. Uh, BGW works exclusively with with churches. Worcester, uh, the the organization up in Worcester, Weaver Construction, they do a lot of church work as well. So over the, the course of several months, we've had many conversations with BGW and Weaver Construction doing our due diligence to put together some type of plan so that we can come to you today and present a plan and say, this is what we've been prayerfully considering, and will you consider doing this with us? So it's an exciting, it's an exciting plan, but it's a big plan. And it's really going to touch 90% of this facility. 90% of what we have here at 8145 North High Street is going to be affected by this. So it's, it's, a, it's a big project. It's going to come in, in two phases. And as we flip through some slides this morning, I want you to keep that in mind. What you see in green is going to be a phase one. What you see in purple will be phase two. And it's very important that we do these in phases back to back and maybe even overlap these phases so we can still do ministry on a week-to-week basis. There's lots of things going on in this building every day during the week, but especially on Sunday, we have kids, we have youth, we have what takes place in here every Sunday. We wanna make sure that, that there's, there's no glitches in that, so there has to be phases. All of this together is anticipated to take about seven months. So keep that in mind as we start looking through these slides. 
So, yeah. you ready? Can, we, can I say something before we go to the slides? Sure, go ahead. Before we get to the meat of it? Yeah. it going back into 2020, I, I love how you said it. Nobody wants to relive 2020. No. Uh, it was very difficult, but we all learned a ton of things through that time. Really, uh, over the last two years, we've learned a ton of things. And one of those things that we learned is how to become more intentional. Okay, what do we need to do? And then what do we not need to do? And one of the things that we need to do is help people engage in relationship with Jesus and relationship with each other. So the vision to follow Jesus together, first and foremost, follow Jesus. Second, do that together. And then also engaging in relationship with one another. Uh, well, we need to maximize our current space in order to do that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk more about that, but uh, we're not going to add a single, uh, a single square foot to our facility. Not a single square foot, but we need to do things differently, mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to look at. Uh, one of the cool things with online, I'll, I'll go back to this for one second, is <coughs> we had actually had a team that was creating an online campus before COVID ever came. So uh, some people call it luck, other people call it a blessing. Uh, back in December of 2019, there, there was a team that was working on an online campus to initiate a new front door to our church so that people could just kind of check out the church before they ever came to the church to make sure that we weren't doing weird stuff or whatever it is, they just needed to check it out. And so that, that took place. It was set to launch on March 26th of 2020, but we, marched, we launched it on like March 13 of 2020 because we had to. I remember I wore like a glow-in-the-dark yellow shirt the first time we were online, and it looked terrible on the camera. So we've learned so much about the intentionality of how to engage, how to help people engage in relationship with Jesus and a relationship with each other, and this is going to help us all the more. So yeah. I just need to say that before no, we get into no, the meat. No, so no. let's go. Let's yeah, go to the meat. I'm so glad you didn't say some of the things we could have done goofy, you know. Oh, we could have done yeah, some. There, there were a lot of goofy Really things. dumb things. So let's, let's look at some of these slides. We're going to start out in what our kids wing, uh, the lower level of this kids wing. This is our newest part of this facility. It's 20 years old, and it's gone through a lot of changes. Uh, just to kind of orient you to uh, what, where, what you're looking at here, the Worthington Christian Village is the big high-rise back here. It's a retirement village as well as some nursing care uh, for our seniors. Uh, so, and then worship center, as you can see, uh, the kids' wings out that way. So 20 years ago, 20 years ago this year, we, we put this thing together and we started digging in the ground and put together this fantastic kids wing. It was really exciting. I remember being a part of that campaign and uh, so it was a lot of fun. But there's some changes that we need to make in that space. Uh, a year ago, we flip-flopped some space. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail here in a minute. But you'll notice right here, I'll use my pointer. I've loved this pointer all week. I've done all sorts of fun things with it. So yeah. But, <laughs> But our, this family lounge and service area, right now, all this is enclosed, and it's a teacher resource room. And it's really come in handy over the years, but we really feel like we need to open this up for families, uh, some interactive, fun things for our kids to do. This is going to be a part of phase one. And then as you look down through here at all this purple space, this is phase two, and a lot of carpet, a lot of paint, a lot of interactive things for our kids. This is exclusively kids. Our, currently, our nursery and toddler space is right here. So if you're new here and you drop your kids off, you're very familiar with these areas. But as new folks come especially, we want to make sure that there's space here for them to be able to interact with each other, get to know each other a little bit, as well as interact with those who work with their kids. So that's a lower level. It's always been kids for the past 20 years. Let's, let's go upstairs now, Justin, if you could give us the next slide. You'll notice that this is all phase one as well. Uh, notice downstairs, the purple, was uh, most of that was phase two because our kids need a place to be able to worship and have classes. So we're going to have to kind of do these at different times. But all this phase one, this is the upper level of our kids' wing back here. It was first designated 20 years ago to be teen space. This small group space that we're really wanting to uh, redesign that area, that was a, a cafe. So think about it. We are way over, um, we're down here someplace right now. So what would happen is when we would send our teenagers off to their space, they would have to go through the kids' space, maybe even down to this hallway, to get to the cafe or go through some of this space to get upstairs. So you had teenagers going down the hallway where little kids are. And so we flip-flopped space recently so that whole wing 
is just kids, and we brought our teens downstairs. Yeah, one of the things we've learned, not just in the last two years, but the last 20 years, is kids' safety has taken a whole new level, yeah. a whole new level in the last 20 years. And we all know the reasons why. We don't need to mention those uh, because they hurt our heart as to why, but kids' safety is huge. And so when somebody comes to our church, especially if they're new, um, you all know what's happening in our community, in our neighborhoods, house goes up for sale, and then, you know, 10 people between families between the ages of 32 and 42 with young kids, they fight in these bidding wars over these houses to be able to get in to the neighborhood or the school. Well, when they come to our church, the number one thing, when they come with their kids, they want their kids to be safe. They want them to be safe. And so we need to be intentional in creating a family lounge space so that those families can meet one another, the parents or the single mom, whoever can get connected into community, but also they immediately know through optics, my kid is safe here. While I come in here and worship and do this, my kid is safe. And so we need a full children's wing that's dedicated just to children, to kids. The second thing we need to do is learning has become very different, especially in the last year. The more interactive the learning, the better the learning. And so we want to create spaces that are more interactive for our kids' ministry, but also that they can all stay that way, that it's not common space that, you know, oh, we have this Bible study group coming in here, and that we don't need to move all that stuff. It needs to be dedicated towards kids. And that's what we're trying to do in our kids' ministry space. Safety, interactive, and a place for parents to meet intentionality. This is how we reach our community. Yeah, well, you know, that, that space has changed quite a bit because like I say, when we first built it 20 years ago, it was teens. That's what, when you came here as a youth minister, Correct. how many years ago was that? Uh, several. Several, okay. <laughs> no, 17 years ago. 17, years, 17 ago, years ago, he came here as a youth minister. And so that's where you hung out with, with the teens. That was a long way away, wasn't it? Yeah, we tore that place up. It was, yeah. it, we had a ton of fun. And that's one of the things, 20 years ago, we've had in, be, in between 100 and 200, sometimes over 200 kids fill up these spaces for the last 20 years. And they, they've destroyed it for good reason. Like they've been so hard on it. I, I remember I the last couple of years I've been walking by in the hallways and doing all this kind of stuff. In these kids' classrooms, I kid you not, there are still box televisions mounted to the wall. Like How many of you have deep. a box television? None of you have a box television. Somebody will raise their hand and say, I don't, well, your picture's terrible. I mean, they're boxed. This is how <laughs> much out of work. date some things are, are doing. The trash won't even take box televisions anymore. So we're, when we get rid of them, we're just going to like get on the roof and throw them off, see how they, yeah. they I, I don't get Don't tell that to Will. So. He might do that. Yeah, so, he might do that. Sure That'd be a youth that's a great idea. Reason. So yeah. just okay. be intentional yeah. there for sure. Go on to the next page. Okay, well, I, yeah. So um, if that whole area is dedicated to our kids now and we've kind of flip flopped the spaces, let's look at where our teens are currently meeting right now. Let's look at that slide. So this is what we have called the Family Life Center, this multi-purpose space right here. Now, when I came here 20, 22, 23 years ago, this actually was teen space. Where it says student classes, that was where our offices were. And then 20 years ago, we, we built an office complex. But some of you guys are nodding your head. You remember that. If you've been here for a long time, you remember when the offices were over here. That There's a little space over here that's now a closet that uh, actually Jay sometimes sneaks in there in this closet, and he works on his sermons, and, but when it gets too cold, you can't go in there. Uh, that's true. Yes. That's, I'm a diva. So it's his little secret. But that used <laughs> to be my cold. office. It was my office years and years yeah. ago. So when we, when we built the new building, 20 years ago, the new building, that's kind of funny, uh, we, we allowed this space to become nursery and toddler. Now think about that. You've got nursery and toddler space here, but then you have to come way over here to the kids' wing. So we actually had nursery and toddler uh, away from the rest of the kids. So, so we've decided, l l let's just flip flop. Let's, let's keep the kids down here, the, the high schoolers, the middle schoolers here. Let's make sure there's some good interactive areas right in these spaces right here. And, uh, and we, just, we just need to make this, this space work for them. Um, there's quite a bit that needs to take place in that space. That was... That was the original worship center. Yeah, here. yeah. Back when, when they first broke ground here in what, 1979, I think it was, that was the first worship center. Raise your hand if you remember that being the worship center. 
There's, there's several of you that can remember that. Wow. Some of you may have been married in that space, which is really kind of cool. So it goes from worship, it goes to, to teens, it goes to like kids, multi-purpose, and now we're saying it really needs to be the teens. We've learned our lesson yeah. over the years. There's some college, there'll be some college space in there as well. Yeah. You know, the, the really cool thing is, is when we started talking about this two years ago, we had this basic design. We're like, okay, we don't have to do anything crazy. Let's just make the, the gym like this big kids worship space and then we'll just do, we'll keep everything and, uh, and some, somebody on our staff, on our staff, not our pastoral staff, came to, uh, to Lee and said, I have an idea. And we, we have uh, team core values. One of those is teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. And they presented this idea to Lee. I, I'm, I wasn't in my closet, but I should have been. I'm in my <laughs> office working on a message for the Sunday. And Lee, like, busts through the door. He's like, you got to come hear this now. I was like, all right, let me finish this thought. And he's like, no, you, now, you got to come hear this. So I went over, and we, we sat there with the other staff member. Actually, it was Carrie Wiley, our and, kids minister, and, and another staff member. And, uh, and they pitched the idea that we flip-flop the spaces, yeah. creating a completely safe kids' space, and then bring the middle school, high schoolers, and college students down into this big gym space and these extra classrooms. And here's the genius. This is one of my favorite parts of the project. The older they get, the closer they get. The older they get, the closer they get to the large gathering so that they can interact within the generations. That if they get coffee, they get to interact. They walk through the hallways, they get to interact. They are close so that when they graduate high school or graduate college, they don't kind of walk in here and be like, okay, what's this? Yeah. Because I've been doing church like this. Believe me, I lived this reality for years as a youth pastor. The older they get, the closer they get. The intentionality of how to bridge the gap between generations within the church. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. And it came from somebody that wasn't even, he's not on our pastoral staff. And this yeah. brings life to the vision for sure. But when he was a teenager, That's that, exactly was, that was his space. That's exactly So that, that kind of spoke to his heart. Well, uh, you'll notice that that's all green, which means that's phase one. And there's a good reason why we need to get that done first, because we got to have to have some place to worship for a few weeks, because the next slide really focuses on the space we're seated in right now. Now, this worship center is 30 years old. It was built in 1993. Do you all remember? Some of you, raise your hand. Who was here in 1993? Some of you guys remember that. You really do. That was a, that was a long time ago. Uh, some of it looks the same as it did 30 years ago. The carpet is the same carpet as it was 30 years ago. The pews are pr pretty stained, and some of them need quite a bit of repair. They're 30 years old. Th this space over here to our right, your left, that was a choir loft. That is concrete. That is concrete. There must have had a sale on concrete 30 years ago because <laughs> there's a lot of concrete in this building. There, th these are the concrete steps. And I, I wasn't going to say this, but back here, in the, there's a choir room back here that people used to prepare for choir before they came out. The roof, the roof over that is concrete. I saw a picture of that. I was like, I never heard of that. But anyway, it's concrete. <laughs> a lot of concrete. But, but we haven't used this choir loft space in a long time. The building's 30 years old, but I don't know the last time we had a choir in here. Do you remember? Yeah, I, I remember. I got corrected last remember. service because oh. in the 17 years that, we, that Addie, my wife Addie and I have been here, I don't ever remember a choir being over there. And then, of course, two people grabbed me the first service and said, you're wrong. And I was like, all right, yeah, okay, I do remember a time or two now because they reminded me. But, I mean, I, I can remember maybe two or three times in 17 years yep. that we've had, like, more than 10 people over in that choir loft. And well, so it's 20% of the room. Yeah, and, and, like, half of the existence of the space for 30 years, maybe for 15 years. Would that be fair? Maybe you need to have a conversation maybe, with I you. Don't know, you know. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but we need to balance this out. We need space to worship. We need more seats in this room to be able to worship because we're growing. We're growing numerically. I definitely believe we're growing spiritually. A lot of great things have happened. It's funny that these are the things in 2020 we're praying about. These are the things that we're planning for when it seems like everything else is shutting down. But God's laying on our hearts, the leadership's heart, to say, what's the future of this church going to look like? when hardly anybody's worshiping. I, I remember, I, I'll never forget this. I remember expert after expert after expert in the church world uh, shared with us. I, I, I remember being physically with one and they said, this was about 2021, the beginning of 2021. They, they looked at me and they said, you need to grieve the people that have, that have left your church because they're not coming back. These are experts. How they're made experts, I don't know. 
They said, you need to grieve them because they're not coming back. And I remember being in here in worship services. One, I remember online when nobody was here, people brought in pictures and posted them on the pews so we didn't feel so alone. There were some kids that brought in stuffed animals so we didn't feel so alone when nobody was in the church during COVID. And then after, I mean, I remember the first time we came, there was like 366 people that came to church like in June of, of 2020 when we opened back up. And it can't last, so this month in January, it's not about the metrics. Metrics are just simple indicators. But the, the first Sunday of the year, there was almost 1,300 people on campus, on campus here. Then the next week, almost 1,300 again. Then last week, there was over 1,300 people on campus with an additional 600 people. That is a conservative count that join us online. Well, they came back. And even more, mm -hmm. even more. What do we do with this space? Because we got problems. We, if somebody new walks into this service right now, I'm telling you, they're going to be uncomfortable because they're not coming down here in the front and sitting here. That's, that's the splash zone at like SeaWorld. They're not going to sit there. So what uh, do we do? It's, it's John's. You know, yeah, but we yeah. know, we've known big John Schmidauer for years. You know, I've spent on him 20 times from that, that point. So, <laughs> Right. Well, some other things that we need to change in the space, it's just not the physical, the seating and the carpeting and, and painting. Yeah. It's, it's 1980s paint, uh, 1993, is a, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing that at all. I'm just saying it, it's different now, and we just kind of need to make sure that we, we make sure that we are presenting things in, in the 20, yeah. 21st century. Uh, there's some technological things we need to do as well. Uh, these screens may actually be difficult to, to see today. This building was not designed to have screens. 1993. Uh, I was 13 years old. Yeah. I was in seventh grade, the grade that our oldest daughter Michael is in right now when, when this was all constructed, yeah. you know, with no technology. The internet was launched in public domain on April 30th, 1993. When this thing, all the plans and when they started the construction, the internet wasn't even available to the general public. Yeah. That's how far back we are in technology. Yeah, so at one point we decided years ago, I think 20 years ago when we added uh, the education wing, we decided we needed to go with some screens. So we built these boxes. They're no longer up there, but there were these closets up, up really up high, like break your neck looking at the, at the screen. And they were rear projection. Well, that didn't last that long because the technology just couldn't keep up with it. And finally, we tore those out. We put the screens down here. And it's difficult sometimes to even see what it is what we're trying to talk about. Hopefully, you're able to see this today. But we need to update that technology. Um, this, this stage, uh, because we're knocking that out, I think we're going to try to level this out. Uh, when this was built back in 1993, there was this enormous pulpit. They called it the Ark. And Marshall Hayden, our, our minister who was here during that time, he was here for a service and he was kind of laughing. I said, how long did that last, Marshall? And he just kind of, I think maybe a year, maybe, because yeah. he had to walk into it and, and it surrounded him. So there's just things that we need to do. We've done some things over the years to keep up, but there's more that we need to do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's I'd, exciting. I'd, yeah, I'd say, you know, so to, to get the gist of this, one, we need to maximize space yeah. because we have space problems. We, we totally have space problems. We have parking problems. Those parking problems are easily solved because uh, two of our friends that are neighbors next to us in these two parking lots, they allow us to park there. So if you're a core part of this church, you need to stop parking in the parking lot and you need to park over to the left side because we got parking space issues. So we need to maximize space. Two, we need to update technology for sure. You can actually turn around and see the projectors that shoot up on the screen. They're up there on the wall. Uh, your, your phone in your pocket is way better than those projectors. And so we need to do things like that. There was a, I have a mentor and I get to talk to him, uh, I don't know, a couple times a year and a uh, phenomenal guy, had a great ministry, has since retired, but he'd always say anytime Time they did something within current facilities and all that kind of stuff, they always adopted this phrase that we're going to do it with excellence, but not extravagance. We're going to do it with excellence, but not extravagance. Uh, church, I don't mean to offend anybody, but our current facility is not excellent. It's average because we use it and we beat it up, especially this space. You know, if you're new, you walk in to our worship space. Look, I'm not knocking anything, but when you walk in, uh, I have a lot of friends that are yet to know Jesus that walk into our church for the first time. One of the first things they think to themselves is, wow, the vision of this church was probably really relevant 30 years ago. Why? Because it feels like 30 years ago. What does it look like to just make a few adjustments to make it relevant for today, aesthetically, excellence without extravagance? And, and, we, do, and we want to retain, we actually want to respect the architectural integrity of, of this space. Uh, central to this worship uh, room is our baptistry. 
And, you know, we just, we just had a baptism, uh, and that was awesome. I love that she kept her glasses on through the baptism. I guess she wanted to see Dad. So that was awesome. Good but job, it, partner. If, if, you, if you look at this, there's a message. The architect worked with our leaders 30 years ago to say, we, we want to communicate a message of what is taking place through baptism. We see the, the burial, the resurrection. We see an enormous cross. If you're right here, you can see it best. But then we have an arrow pointing pointing north where the Holy Spirit uh, and the ascension. And it's just beautiful, and it's beautiful on the outside. We don't want to do anything to change that. If anything, we want to do something to enhance it. So, yes, there's some physical things we need to do in this space. There's some technological improvements we need to, to, to do as well. Let's take a look take a at look. some concept art. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, here, here's what it uh, is projected to look like. We've got another slide as well. This is pretty close to what, you know, every week we have meetings with our architect, and we keep coming back to this, so um, this, this is pretty accurate to, to what we're at right now. Uh, there's a concept video as well, so Justin, I'm going to have you roll that. So a lot, of, a lot of meetings have taken place to be able to present this today, just doing our due diligence to make sure that we're, we're presenting as, as close to being accurate as we can what we've talked uh, with architects over the past several months. Uh, you can imagine that a project of this size is, is going to cost quite a bit, and it is. It's, it's a big project that's going to cover 90% of this facility. So uh, to be able to do everything that we've talked about here at 8145 North High Street we're projecting that to cost about four million dollars. That's quite a quite a bit, um, and uh, and so that's that's a big ask to ask our congregation to to say, would you commit above and beyond your regular giving, to dig down, to be even ge more generous, and to say, hey, we we can contribute to this. It, this isn't the very first time that our church has gone through a process like this. Um, they had to do this when they first bought this property back in the early 70s. They did it again when they had to, to build the first facility that is now our, our uh, teen area. Uh, then again when they built this facility, and, and again 20 years ago when we built our kids' wing. So, but every time throughout the history of this church, uh, this church has proven herself to be very generous with resources. Uh, even when we ask every Thanksgiving, we say, hey, we're going to have a Thanksgiving offering and we're going to provide for three of our mission partners. We say we need $100,000 to bless people that are in a really difficult time in their missions, wherever that might be. Uh, how much was raised uh, back in yeah, Thanksgiving? Yeah, the goal was 100 and we went 135000 This 100, is above 000. and beyond. Above and beyond. So the total missions giving from just last year alone was over $500,000. Yeah. That's of incredible. a three million dollar budget, over five hundred went to our missionary partners. This is a generous church. This is a generous church, and so, but this is a generous ask. So, uh, if you would put a, a slide up uh, this week, if you did receive one of these mailers, you received one of these commitment cards as well. If you did not receive one of these uh, commitment cards, are in the generous uh, bins at the back, our, our giving boxes, and then there's some more of these uh, brochures that are out in the atrium. You, you'll find those. We have a timeline out there of the history of, of the church. You'll notice, though, that if this facility is going to cost $4 million, we're asking for $5 million. Why would we ask for $5 million? Yeah, in order to reach here and to reach everywhere, the front and the back, uh, here and then everywhere, the online, that's going to cost $4 million. About $3 million or so worth of structure and then another million dollars in technology. But then there's an additional $1 million because 
our reach initiative is to reach here, reach there, and reach everywhere. So the reach there piece is a million dollars set aside as seed money to be able to dream about how we can more effectively reach the communities north of us. It's dream money. Five million dollars is a lot of money. It's a lot of money, especially over the course of two years. Could we do this over the course of 10 years? For sure. But the step of faith, the God orchestrated risk is the two year piece. No doubt about that. It's a lot of money. And so we are asking the church if we would all consider partnering above and beyond our normal giving to make the REACH initiative a, po a possibility, to make this possible. How can we give yeah. to do this? You'll see, of course, on the commitment card, there's, de there's several different things that we can commit to, le levels of commitment. Uh, we have kids' ministry stuff. Yeah. They're committing to things. I've had conversations with my daughters about their commitment to things. I mean, this is going to take all of us. What's the vision of our church? To follow Jesus together. Well, in order to do something like this, we have to do it together. And so it is a big ask. Now on Sunday, March 19th, Sunday, March 19th, please put that on your calendar. We are going to have a commitment Sunday. So whether you received a commitment card in the mail or you go out here in the atrium to our reach station, you pick up a, a reach commitment card or you, they're located right here in our giving bins. On Sunday, March 19th, we are gonna ask every single person in the church to give to this. Uh, Lee, I know that you yeah. talked about the 562 a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we have 562, roughly 562 giving units. That's individuals or families that give on a weekly basis. And, you know, that kind of, some years it's more, some years it's less. But um, uh, we want 100% participation. We, we want everybody to be involved, and we've set this up so that everybody could be involved. If you, if you look down at the very bottom of, of this chart, you see that we need 200 giving units to give an additional $500 for the two years. That's $250 more per year than what you might normally give to like our general fund, uh, which if we can get that, that's $100,000. And you can work your way up and we want you to see yourself on this chart to say, where, where can we be? How can we prayerfully consider how we might be able to give and we might be able to sacrifice to make this a possibility? The exciting thing is, is our, our leadership and a few other folks that have been praying about this with us, about this Sunday in particular, have, have already done some, some pre-commitments. And uh, as of even yesterday, we're close to $800,000 already being committed to, to date. But we still need another 530 uh, giving units yeah. to participate. Yeah. So we're, we're excited about that. We're excited for folks to say, hey, we want to commit something early. We've heard about this, and we've been in prayer for you about this, and we want to commit early. So that, that's very encouraging. Yeah. May we all be praying uh, how we can serve and support the REACH initiative so that we can become more intentional. I'll close out with a story, and then we're going to have one of our elders come up and pray with us. Uh, I was on the phone with somebody that I'll, I'm really close to on Friday. We catch up about every other Friday, and this person's yet to know Jesus. I've known them my entire life, and they were asking about, you know, hey, how things go on, how's things at the church, and I shared with them about the REACH initiative. And they're like, well, I'm sure there's a price tag on that. I said, yeah, the price tag is $5 million. And they started to laugh at me. Kid you not, they started to laugh at me. And they said, well, what's the plan to get an additional $5 million? I said, uh, the church is gonna give more. And then they really laughed at me, laughed. And said, so your plan, the leadership's plan is that the church is just gonna give more to make this possible. I said, that's the plan. And they laughed. They said, so you're not going to sell cookies or do like a car wash? Or I'm like, what, are we supposed to sell cookies for like $100,000 a piece? I mean, what, what are you talking about here? It's a lot of cookies. And they laughed. Why? Because they're yet to know Jesus. They're yet to know Jesus. Following Jesus is sacrificial. It is sacrificial. And it doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when it comes to the resources of this world. But does it make sense? to reach our community, to become even more intentional. And that's gonna take resources for sure, sacrifice on all our parts. We can do this, church. We can absolutely do this, but it is a God orchestrated risk. So at this time, uh, Ben Mays, uh, one of our elders, Ben and his wife Emily have served on our eldership team for the last couple of years. Ben's been a part of this process literally since the, its inception uh, a little over two years ago. But we're going to ask Ben uh, to pray for us and then we're going we're gonna to worship. We're going to sing one last song and worship out. But remember March 19th, Commitment Sunday. Thanks for your time.
pray that this has been beneficial for us all. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> These are big changes, and big changes can be scary, but they can also be exciting, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do in this church and in this community. So let's uh, faithfully pray for the church leadership and, and for the, the staff and, and as we move into this time of change. Lord, uh, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity to make a big impact on our congregation and on this church, and, and more importantly, a big impact on the community. Um, as you know, you've said to you who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Lord, we ask that you do that. You do more than we can ask or imagine as we try to seek and save those that are lost in this community. Um, we ask that you help us to be a guiding light for you and that we follow you faithfully. And through our faith, uh, we can have some impact on the community around us. We thank you for everything you've already done for us. You know, we are a blessed church. We are a blessed community. And, um, you know, we're just excited to see what we can do to faithfully serve you in this community. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.